that's in eternity past. And uh, saw that, of course, he's the creator. He's the one who gave us the Old Testament and all this prophecies that are there about his, his coming, his names, and so on. Last week, look, last week, we looked at what Jesus is doing now. Jesus is very busy right now. He's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Uh, he's uh, representing us as, as Christians in heaven. This week... I want us to look at Jesus' life on earth. That's what we sang some of, the, some of the songs that we did. You know, the Bible says in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But then la later on in that chapter, verse 14, it says, and the Word became flesh. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And uh, that's, that's what we're looking at this morning. Uh, God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, Jesus' time on earth. Now, in Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 21, he gives the, um, the theme of, of his sermon. This is Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost. He says, It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then he gives kind of a miniature uh, history or a condensed version of the life of Christ. Verse 22, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye've taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. We just stop reading there. In those three verses, he gives much of the life of Christ, just very condensed uh, portion. It's interesting that he doesn't mention the birth, because when you talk about somebody's life, you just assume they've been born. And uh, he, he doesn't mention that a lot. And then later on, he, he talks about his, his ascension as well. I want to I just talk about five basic things about the life of, of Christ this morning. And of course, this time of year, we can't uh, not mention the birth of Christ. In uh, Matthew chapter one, uh, Joseph was thinking about his fiance being with child, and an angel said to him in verse 20, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. You know, God comforted Joseph, and God uh, instructed him. Uh, verse 21, she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from, his, from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, and he quotes here from Isaiah, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So uh, Jesus is born. He's born of a virgin, the Bible tells us. That's a miracle. Uh, that doesn't happen normally. It only happened once. And it's only with Jesus. And as Jesus was born, you can see through Scripture, he had two natures. He's God. He's also a man, a person. And uh, Jesus is God the Son. He's both divine and human. You see that in, in John when it talks uh, about uh, the, the Word being God and then the Word was made flesh. God became a man. You see it in the name there in Matthew, Emmanuel. God with us. You see it in other portions of Scripture. For instance, Isaiah said in Isaiah 9, 6, Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. You see his humanity. You see as well then, And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. Uh, many of those are things that uh, you don't think of with the child at, at, at Bethlehem. And yet that's who he is. He's the Everlasting Father. Uh, Father, the Prince of Peace. Uh, Jesus is both human and divine. In 1 Timothy 3, he says, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? God was manifest in the flesh. Now, the devil and the world have tried to imitate that and, and devalue that. Uh, kids, I'm sorry, but superheroes aren't real. All right? Uh, 
These false gods that Thor is not real. Uh, that's just uh, Satan and the world trying to devalue the, the real thing in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And He's completely God. He's completely man. Not like these uh, false uh, superheroes. Uh, the nature of Christ, you see in Philippians chapter 2. Turn there if you, if you would like to. Philippians chapter 2. Probably looking at this several times over this last month. He's talking about Christ. In verse 6 he says, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. That's an important statement. It's just saying it, Jesus was not grasping. He was not get, claiming something that wasn't his own when he said, I'm the Lord of glory. I'm the great I am. He wasn't, uh, he's, he wasn't lying when he says that he's equal with God. But then he, the Bible goes on and says, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus, God, Jesus, man, a human and divine. Jesus had a body, he had a, a spirit, he had a soul. Jesus had a childhood. That just boggles my mind. <laughs> you, know, you see pictures of little babies and things. And, and Jesus was a, a helpless baby. And in that baby is, is God. I, I don't understand that completely. But... Uh, you know, what a wonderful thing it is. And let me say this. Jesus would not have been, a, it would not have been a problem for his brothers and sisters. Uh, it would have been wonderful to have Jesus as your brother. It would not have caused any problems in the home. It would have sorted them out. Uh, he had a childhood. He also had human needs. You, know, you read in scripture about him getting tired, getting sleepy, um, hungry, having sorrow. You know, Jesus experienced all the things that we do. In fact, in Hebrews it says he was tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And that's, that's a relief <laughs> because he's God, you know. He's, he's able to face these temptations yet without sin. That's why he can be our Savior. You see, it, it requires a perfect lamb, doesn't it? And that's what Jesus is. You and I can't qualify, but Jesus can. So we see his birth. We also see his life. Uh, in, in Acts chapter 2 there, just in, in one verse, um, Peter covered it. A man, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Do you ever think about all the people that would have been affected by Jesus' life, just, just physically? You know, when, when the, the disciples began to preach the gospel... People really responded. You know, the closer they were in time and space to Jesus' life, thousands responded. You know, Peter preached at Pentecost and thousands were saved. It's because many of them either had been affected personally or knew someone who'd been affected personally by the life of Jesus. Can you imagine being a blind person and all of a sudden you can see? You talk about a life that's changed. It's like the man in the Gospels where they were trying, the Pharisees were trying to get him, he'd been healed of, of blindness. And they were trying to get him to say Jesus was no good. He said, well, I don't understand all that, but this, I know this, I was blind, now I see. Listen, you meet Jesus, it'll change your life. And you'll know it. You see the life of Christ. One of the, the first things you see is him in the temple. I had to check this, I had to stop and think. Um, they took him to the temple when he was eight days old to be circumcised. Yeah, I, I thought, that's interesting. I'm not going to go into it, but <laughs> uh, it's interesting. And then you see him 12 years later as they come to the temple. And uh, you know the story, how the, the, everybody leaves and Jesus is there talking to the teachers. and uh, They're just amazed at this young fella and uh, what he can say. But then the main thing you see in, in the ministry of Christ is when he comes for his baptism with John the Baptist. And God the Father speaks, and God the Holy Spirit descends in the likeness of a dove, and God the Son is there. Uh, you know, what a, what a picture that is. And straight from there, he goes to his temptation. And the Bible says he's tempted like as we are, yet without sin, and begins his 
his ministry. Turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 4. I thought we'd just work our way through some of the things in the life of Christ. You won't get credit for this, but this is kind of a mini course in the life of Christ this morning. The simple thing to do is to read the Gospels. It's all there. Uh, Luke chapter 4, uh, verse, verse 14, for instance. This is right after his temptation. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. Jesus began his ministry, and, and it was an amazing thing. Down in verse 21, he had, he'd read from the scriptures, and he said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Can you imagine? You know, if somebody came in and said, yeah, this scripture is about me, you know, you think, whoa, what's going on here? Uh, he was different. In, uh, in, in verse um, 32 of that chapter, it says, they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. There's another place where it says, not like the, the scribes and Pharisees, <laughs> you know, they waffled on. Uh, not Jesus. Boy, he got right to the point. You knew what he was talking about, and it, it spoke to your heart. Uh, in, in verse 43, he said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. You know, we don't think of Jesus as a preacher. That's what he was. I, I don't know how you, you, you know, we kind of just have this non-thought about Jesus, I think, sometimes. But one of the main things he did was he preached. He was a preacher. I, boy, I'm looking forward in heaven. Maybe we'll hear him preach there. Uh, his ministry began. And part of it, like Peter talked about there in Acts chapter 2, was miracles. Uh, verse 33 of chapter 4. In the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy it? To destroy us, I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and hurt him not. And they were all amazed, and spake among themselves, saying, What word is this? For with authority and power he commandeth the unclean spirit, and they, came, they come out. And the fame of him went out in every place of the country round about. Uh, Jesus did miracles. Uh, Jesus did preaching. Uh, uh, so much that went on in his life. It must have been a, a busy life. Uh, he called his disciples in uh, chapter 5, uh, verse 10 and, and, and 11 there. Uh, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, partners with Simon. Jesus said to Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Jesus said, Follow me. Boy, they, they laid it down and uh, they went with him. And what a, what a ministry they had as they spent night and day with him, uh, being trained in those, those three years that they walked with Christ. Uh, they saw so much. Uh, they saw the transfiguration. It, uh, reading that this week, it, uh, I thought, I, I'm not sure what happened there, but in, uh, in Luke chapter 9, it says, As he prayed, it's verse 29, the fashion of his countenance was altered. So how he looked was altered. And his raiment was white and glistering. That would have been an amazing thing to see as though these men walked with Jesus, the transfiguration. Uh, they, they saw his deity. You know, as he, had, as he spoke and had power over the wind and the waves and, and, and the things that, that, that he did. They saw that he was human. Yeah, they saw him tired. They saw him, you know, with the human things of life. But they also saw that he was deity. They, thought, they saw that he was Christ. And uh, you know, what a blessing it was for them as they uh, responded to his, his ministry. One of the things he said in, in Act, uh, Luke chapter nine, uh, 7, verse 29. Luke chapter 7. This just gives the setting here. It says, verse 29, All the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. So are those who, man, they... This is Jesus. We, we like him. But look at the next verse. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. Others said, oh, we don't like him. And uh, later on, uh, Jesus, Jesus says in uh, Luke chapter 12 and verse 51, Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth? 
I tell you nay, but rather divisions. And you know, it's still true today. Jesus is the great divider. What you think about Jesus is the line for eternity. And, and let me tell you, I, I, I'll give away the end of the story. You need to be on Jesus' side. Uh, you, you will not prosper in eternity if you're not. Uh, he's the great divider. You, you know it. It divides families. Uh, there's folks who they get saved. Uh, there's a man who wrote a, a, a famous song, No One Understands Like Jesus. Uh, when he got saved, his wife left him. She said, I not in, I'm not, wasn't in it for this. Uh, and, and it's happened to others. He's the great divider because you either believe him or you don't. And when you believe him, uh, it changes your life. And when you don't, you don't want to be around somebody that's life has been changed like that. But let me tell you, it's, it's worth it in Jesus Christ. Uh, his purpose was to call sinners to repentance. In uh, Luke chapter 5 and verses 31 and 32, he, he'd been associating with sinners. And they were criticizing him. And he said, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And folks, the Bible says we've all sinned. So he came for everyone, even those people who were condemning him for that. Christ came uh, to, to preach repentance. In, uh, in chapter 18 and uh, verse 31, Jesus makes a statement ahead of time as to what he would experience. Luke 18, verse 31 he took on him the twelve and said to them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on. And they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. Folks, that's the gospel. Jesus said, we're going to go, and we're going to, and basically, I, he is, is going to experience the gospel. He's going to live the gospel. Be crucified, buried, rise again. And that's why Jesus came, to, to live the gospel. It's interesting that in the gospels, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each one, about a third of each book is about the last week of Christ's life. Did you know that? You know, all the things, you know, John said, all the books in the world wouldn't fill you know, if we wrote down everything that, about Jesus, you, you just couldn't write it all down. They just give such a minimal report, really, of his life. But the last week, boy, they really focus in on it. Do you know why? That's the gospel. That's when he died and was buried and, and rose again. It's, it's the most important uh, part of, of Jesus' life in, in one sense. And the, the Bible says that, uh, that Jesus lived. He really lived. <laughs> But he also died. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, the Bible says. And, uh, you know, Peter, in, in giving his uh, short report on, on the life of Christ, uh, covers that in, in one verse, Acts chapter 2 and, and verse 23. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you've taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Listen, he didn't try and soft soap it, did he? He didn't try and cover it up. He said, you. You've killed him. And I guess he would have been saying we in, in, in that sense as well. Uh, Jesus gave his life. You know, the Bible says, Jesus said in John chapter, uh, John chapter 10, I lay down my life. He went on and said, no man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. Uh, Christ gave his life. Later on in, in 1 Corinthians the Bible calls him Christ our Passover. Christ our Passover. If you know anything about the Passover, it's when they, they put the blood on the, on the doorposts. And as the angel of death would go over, if the blood was on the doorposts, he would leave them alone. There's life. Christ is our Passover. Christ is the one whose blood was shed. The perfect Lamb of God. And when we have the blood of Christ, when we're, when we're covered by the blood of Christ, our sins are covered by his blood. Uh, we have forgiveness. There's cleansing. It's an amazing thing. Now, his blood makes salvation possible. Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. It's not by religion. It's not by good works. 
It's not by your culture. You, know, you can be the most cultured, kind uh, person in the world. It won't save your soul. The Bible says we've all sinned and we need the blood of Christ. We, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Uh, Christ came to die for our sins. Hebrews 9 says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Jesus, the disciples said in Acts chapter 4, neither is there salvation in any other. For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's only by the name of Jesus. Boy, that's, that's what Jesus called the narrow way. Only one. No other name, no other person, no other way. He's the way. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, he said. Yeah, that's, that's scary in one way, but it's wonderful in another way. There is a way. There's a way to know God. And it's found in the person of Jesus Christ. God became a man. Emmanuel, God with us. That's the beauty of... I love Christmas, you know. Thinking about how God cared enough about us that He came. He became a man like me. Well, maybe not exactly like me. But, uh, you know, he, he felt... If he, Hit his hand with a hammer, he, he felt it. If, if somebody you did something, he knew about it. You know, he heard, he saw, he felt. Um, God became a man so that I could know him. And he offers everlasting life. You probably know John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. <coughs> what a wonderful thing. Now, Jesus died. After his death, he was buried. I've always thought it interesting that they borrowed a tomb. Only Jesus could borrow a tomb. He only needed it for three days, you know. You and I, we can't do that. Uh, but Jesus did. And the Bible says then that he rose again. And Peter, again, he covered that in one verse. Him being, uh, he's slain, verse 24, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Death could not hold him. You know, we, the song we sing, death could not hold his prey. Jesus, my Savior, up from the grave he rose. I, I just about had to sing that this morning, but uh, uh, we didn't. We could have. The resurrection is the cornerstone of Christianity. You realize that? Without the resurrection, Christianity is just useless. In fact, uh, when the Bible declares in, in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, I declare unto you the gospel. One of the things he says is that without the resurrection, let me read it. If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. If there's no resurrection, the word vain means empty. Without the resurrection, Christianity is empty. It's useless. Oh, it might be fun getting together and singing songs and you know whatever that we enjoy, but... It would be useless without the resurrection. Christ rose from the dead. And he says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're of all men most miserable. <laughs> but now is Christ risen. Christ is risen from the dead. Now, it's the truth. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. And in Acts chapter 1, it talks about how he spent 40 days then after his resurrection. Let me read it. Acts 1 verse 3. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Jesus taught his disciples. Uh, he did uh, several things uh, between the time of his resurrection and his, his ascension. And then in, in Acts chapter 1, we see that, that Jesus went back to heaven. Uh, before he did, he, he re renewed the promise of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, verse 4, Wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you've heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Not many days hence. The Holy Spirit is coming. He gave his last words. You know, they wanted to know details. He said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and under the uttermost part of the earth. He said, don't worry about those details. You just do what you need to do. Do what I've told you to do. Be the witnesses uh, that, uh, that I've prepared you to be. And then the Bible says he was taken up. 
Let me read it. Verse 9 of Acts 1. When he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. What a promise. Basically, he said, what are you doing standing here looking? Get busy. He's coming back. Just like he left, he's coming again. And what, a, what a blessing it is to have the promises of God. God has always kept his promises. The, the coming of Jesus. Yeah, Christmas is not just... Don't, don't you get sick of all these different explanations of what Christmas is all about? You know? Oh, it's all about in 25 different things and none of them are the real thing. Uh, the fact that Jesus came was the, the culmination of hundreds of prophecies that God had given in the Old Testament, and he fulfilled every one exactly. It, what an amazing thing. And he came uh, to live and to die and to rise again and, and to go to heaven and, and, and represent us. You know, he's our Savior. Uh, Jesus was made flesh and dwelt on the earth. Emmanuel, God with us. Born of a virgin, the God-man, gave his life for sin. For your sin, for my sin. It's hard to imagine that God has us in his mind. But he does. Jesus knew that we would be here today. Jesus knew the sins that I would commit. And he loved me anyway. And he died for them. He came out of the grave to conquer sin and death. He ascended back into glory. and Salvation's work was done. Sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Uh, the Bible says there in, in Acts 2 and, and verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And their response was, what must we do? What must we do to be saved? And I, I hope that's your response this morning as well, if you don't know Christ as your Savior. Uh, God sent the Holy Spirit uh, to convict us of sin, to call us to Himself. You know, there's so much to the life of Christ. Like I mentioned earlier, John said, all the books in the world couldn't, couldn't contain what, what God has done. But let me just conclude with, with one verse. I mentioned it already. One of the reasons Jesus came is stated in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus came because of God's love for us. And he was willing to lower himself, humble himself, even to death. The death of a cross, which is, is a shameful death. We wouldn't do it that way today. Oh, that would not, that would, you know, there'd be 28 different laws against it. But Christ was willing to suffer and die for us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And the other reason is, is there as well, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God made us to live for eternity. And God wants you to spend eternity with him. That's why Jesus came. He's always been the Lamb of God. He's always been God the Son. Even in the Old Testament, when they did that symbolic slaughtering of a lamb and, and so on, uh, that was Jesus. That was, that was a representation of what Jesus would do. In the Old Testament, they were saved by faith in Jesus, the coming Lamb. In the New Testament, they're saved by faith in Jesus. Today, we're saved by faith in Jesus. He's the only way. He's always been the only way. And God knew that. Uh, the Bible says in 2 Peter, He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants you to know Him. And you know, our world and our, our lives are sometimes pretty messed up. But there's hope in the Lord. Uh, this life is not all there is. We might live five years or, I mean... Science has its way. We might live 500 years, but we're still going to die. And your hope is eternity. Let me tell you, your hope is not your house. It's not your car. It's not your health. It's not even your family. I love my family. Listen, I wouldn't give my son for anybody. <laughs> I'm glad God gave his son. He loves you a lot more than I do. This great God, this lovely Savior did all this because of love for us. And you know, at Christmas, that's, that's a good thing to remember. And it's a good opportunity to share Christ with others.
You know, the Bible says that it's our sin that separates us from God. And the Bible says that Christ is the only bridge. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Only one. You don't take that way, you, there's no other way. Christ is the way to God. It's by faith in Jesus Christ. The great creator became my savior. What a wonderful thing it is. Won't you trust him today? Faith in Christ. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Listen, push aside religion. Push aside culture. and Push aside your own ideas. And just focus on Christ. He's the Savior. And He can save you. He promises if someone comes to Him, He'll in no wise cast them out. You have His promise. And God always keeps His promises. In fact, He cannot lie. Let me encourage you this morning. Now, we're going to sing a, a song, Only Trust Him. And th that's the words that I would give to you. Only trust Him. Trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and, and then we're going to uh, have a song. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Lord, as we think of your coming and, Lord, of your life, your death, your resurrection, and, and Lord, what you're doing now for us, that you sent your Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, we, we ask that you help us to understand the word. Lord, if, if there are those here this morning that are not saved, that they would see through all the difficulties of life and understand uh, that Jesus is the Savior. Father, help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's page 163 in, in your songbook there. Only